Oh, just to make sure my audio works because uh, I saw some message. Okay, cool. Yeah, it is working. And now we are online in, through uh, the YouTube streaming. So welcome everybody for coming to this new uh, Iparcos Astro Seminar. Today, it is a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Fang Zhu Jiang, who is a, a, a colleague, a good friend uh, in, of, of me in, in Israel in uh, our Post, first postdoctoral years uh, there with uh, Avishai Dekel. Fang Zhu is an expert on theory, form, uh, theory of galaxy formation and evolution, mostly using uh, semi-analytical models, but also analyzing uh, cosmological simulations. He uh, did his PhD in the Yale University uh, under the supervision of uh, Banden Bosch, if I am not wrong. Um, and uh, he presented the, 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 the thesis on, in 2016. After that, he moved to the Hebrew University of uh, Israel, in, of Jerusalem in Israel, uh, in where he worked in collaboration with uh, Abishai Dekel, Jonathan Frondley, that was also a, a speaker in, in these seminars, uh, also with me and other people in, in the, in the uh, university. And after that, in 2019, uh, he moved uh, with a treasure scholar at Caltech, and he's also a theory fellow in the Carregui uh, Observatories. He, this is the current position for Fang Zhu. Uh, uh, it's a uh, four years uh, position. And after that, he uh, got, uh, already got a position to be a permanent professor in, the, in uh, China. So it's uh, uh, good news for, for research in general because he's a very good researcher, Fang Zhu, in, the, in all these models of, semi, of, of, uh, of all these uh, semi analytical models of galaxy formation and evolution. That in fact, just to tell that uh, one of the big achievements of, uh, of Fang Zhu is that he developed a model, a semi-analytical model uh, for satellite accretion that is called as a SatGen, a very, very nice tool for, for this kind of, uh, of analysis. I know that there is many other things that I could say about the, about the Fang Zhu's uh, career, but well, uh, I will let uh, Fang Zhu to add some more details if he wants, and if not, we can start with the uh, with, uh, with the talk. Thank you a lot for accepting the invitation and uh, you can start with the talk as, uh, when you want. Oh, thank you very much, Santi, for the warm words and the nice introduction. Uh, so, uh, and Fang Zhu Jiang. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to be here and talk to you about our recent studies on galaxy halo connection and the near field cosmology using simulations and the semi-analytic frameworks. Uh, so this is, uh, these are a series of works in collaboration with the people listed here, uh, or excellent collaborators. Um, so we know that in our standard model of cosmology, the lambda plus cold dark matter paradigm, uh, about 85% of the matter density is in dark matter. And dark matter forms gravitationally bound structures, named, namely dark matter halos, which provide the sites for galaxy formation. They provide a potential well for gas condensation and the star formation. Halos grow hierarchically, so smaller halos form first, and then they uh, merge uh, with each other along this called cosmic filaments or cosmic walls, uh, nodes, uh, and they become larger halos, and larger halos host larger galaxies, and the smaller uh, remnants become so-called subhalos, or if you want, uh, satellite galaxies, if you uh, look at it from the galaxy formation perspective. So I'm going to talk about halo formation, galaxy halo connection, and uh, the statistics or demographics of the satellite population in my talk. Uh, we know we can use dark matter um, halo structure to constrain cosmology. Uh, for example, uh, in a standard paradigm, the CDM paradigm, halos are basically triaxial and have a cuspy or dense center. In the alternative model that people are exploring nowadays, for example, the, uh, in, a, in a model where dark matter particles can scatter with each other, called self-interacting dark matter, halos are generally rounder due to the uh, scattering process and the, the, and the thermalization of the center. And the central density is therefore uh, slightly lower than the CDM. So if you plot the uh, circular velocity profile, and if, if, if you have observational data of the say uh, gas kinematics and the stellar kinematics, in principle, you can uh, distinguish one model from another. Yeah. 
but the universe is usually not so kind to us, right? So even nowadays we have, we do have the uh, baryon kinematics that is measured down to very small radii with super high spatial resolution. We still cannot easily distinguish these two models or other alternative models because halos and the, their inhabitant galaxies interact with each other. Uh, for example, we have this effect called uh, adiabatic contraction uh, whereby uh, we, if you have a baryon potential established in the, in the dark matter halo, like the galaxy, right? the stellar component, the gaseous component, uh, and the dark matter will experience the pull, the gravitational pull from the baryon component and the halo will, uh, the dark matter halo will, uh, will respond accordingly and contract. And similarly, um, it's the opposite effect. Uh, basically, uh, we have uh, supernova explosions and uh, uh, AGN uh, active galactic nuclei driven uh, gas outflows, which can also perturb the gravitational potential of the dark matter and cause the expansion of the halo and the so called cusp to core transformation. Uh, so, I will use the jargon's cusps and cores, where cusp means a steep uh, density profile in the center. And the core means uh, generally a flatter uh, density profile or even completely flat profile. Yeah. So the upshot is we need to understand the halo responses to baryon processes before we can say anything about cosmology using the halo structure that is probed by uh, stellar kinematics or gaseous kinematics. Oh, by the way, please uh, feel free to stop me uh, with clar clarification questions anytime. So this is uh, uh, one aspect of galaxy halo connection, i.e. the mutual uh, connection uh, through gravity uh, between the dark matter and uh, the baryon component. Uh, more generally speaking, the study of galaxy halo connection refers to the question, what kind of galaxies live in what kind of dark matter halos? So very intuitively or even somewhat trivially, uh, we know uh, through the so-called uh, the abound halo abundance matching technique, um, larger galaxies, uh, or I should say more massive galaxies populate more massive dark matter halos. So the horizontal axis is the halo mass or the viral mass and the vertical axis is the galaxy mass, including uh, stars and, uh, and all baryons. Um, also, uh, we know larger galaxies populate larger halos. Here, large simply refers to their uh, physical sizes, right? So we have dwarfs, Milky Way analogs, and uh, uh, early type or um, spheroid or elliptical galaxies. Uh, the number one driver of uh, galaxy properties is the dark matter halo mass, right? So this is the, basically what's underlying the abundance matching technique and the mass uh, corresponds one-to-one -to, -one to, uh, the radius of the halo or the viral radius of the halo, uh, through the simple definition. So mass goes as the volume times, uh, threshold density times the critical density of the universe. So delta is arbitrarily set to say 200 for the viral parameter. So mass and the viral radius are equivalent, are equivalent to each other. Uh, nowadays we are looking for the secondary halo parameters, which are believed to be responsible for the scatter of these relations. And these secondary parameters include the halo structural parameters like the concentration, uh, like uh, their uh, uh, shape. Uh, they also include uh, the growth history, uh, the large scale environment, et cetera, of the, of the dark matter halos. And uh, these are believed to be responsible for the scatter. For example, uh, if we draw a vertical line here at a given halo mass or halo size, uh, we have a, a wide spectrum of galaxies ranging between compact dwarf ellipticals all the way to the uh, so-called uh, the recently very popular ultra diffuse population. They have comparable sizes to the Milky Way, but their uh, stellar masses are comparable only to uh, dwarf ellipticals. Uh, another aspect of galaxy halo connection uh, is the demographics of satellites. Uh, the number counts of uh, satellite population in a host. For example, this is a Milky Way sized host uh, in a simulated universe uh, in, the, in the Elvis simulation. The right hand side is a cartoon uh, version of the real uh, Milky Way. So there are several uh, small scale issues of the standard Lambda CDM paradigm, although it's quite successful on the large scales, right? 
Here I list four of them. Um, to begin with, we have the uh, a very old uh, missing satellites problem uh, uh, date, uh, dating back to the late 90s. So uh, basically people uh, by running higher and higher resolution and body simulations realized that uh, there are numerous small, uh, small, smaller halos orbiting a big halo, like here is the Milky Way sized halo. It has numerous number of uh, small satellites. Whereas the actual Milky Way, although the more recent surveys discover more and more satellites, it's still the number count of satellites uh, is not comparable to the simul simulation revealed. Uh, but there are way, trivial ways uh, to uh, alleviate the missing satellite issue. Basically, uh, we know that from realization, there are high energy photons that can prevent the gas in the smaller halos to, from cooling. So essentially you can have uh, truly dark dark matter halos without star formation. So they can remain not visible to us. Uh, so this basically hand waving solves the uh, missing satellite problem. But a more persistent issue is the so-called typic to fail problem. So if you focus on the massive population, if you say if you pick the top 10 most massive satellites of the Milky Way, and compare them to the top 10 observed satellites, okay? Then you realize that in the rotation curve space, so this is the circular velocity on the y-axis and the, the distance to the Milky Way, uh, to, the, to the satellite center in, in the horizontal axis, right? So the uh, Milky Way satellites, the bulk of it um, is, cons uh, are, is consistent with uh, uh, maximum circular velocity below 25 kilometers per second. Whereas the simulated population of matching number all have a Vmax larger than that value. Um, actually, Milky Way also have the two Magellanic clouds which are higher uh, up, upper there. So it's essentially a gap, a Vmax gap or circular velocity gap between the large and the small Magellanic clouds and the, uh, the, the rest of the Milky Way satellite population. Uh, and the simulations, the top 10-ish uh, simulated satellites all, uh, all seem to fill this gap. So these satellite halos are believed to be, that they have potential wells that are too deep or too big to fail forming stars. That's where the name uh, come, comes from. Very much related to the to, to fail issue, we have the structural diversity issue of bright dwarf galaxies. So if you, again, focus on the um, uh, velocity scale, say the Magellanic Clouds velocity scale of, uh, uh, say, 70, 80 uh, kilometers per second, given this mass scale or velocity scale, observationally, we see a wide spectrum of, of rotation curves as represented by the data points, ranging between strongly cuspy or steeply rising rotation curves all the way to a slowly rising or cord, strongly cord uh, dark matter profile. So remember that cord refers to a flat center and the, v and the circular velocity refers to the enclosed mass. So they can be translated to each other. So on the simulation side, right, whether or not you include the baryon process doesn't uh, seem to help very much. In the black case, it's the dark matter only simulation. In the colored bands, uh, we have a, a hydro simulation uh, so the upshot is uh, we do get some range, but the range uh, uh, allowed by the simulation, by, uh, by baryon uh, feedback is still too narrow compared to the uh, full spectrum of uh, structural diversity in the real universe. And the last but not least, we have a spatial distribution issue of satellites. So there are different flavors of this issue. Uh, pe some people focus more on the like the planar dis uh, distribution of uh, uh, large satellites. Uh, uh, Santi uh, did uh, some work on this uh, on this uh, regard. But more recently, uh, the spatial distribution issue also uh, is manifested in uh, in the fact that uh, if you consider Milky Way or Andromeda, their satellite distribution. Uh, so this is the cumulative number as a function of distance to the Milky Way center. So the satellites are in the real universe seem to be more concentrated than uh, uh, what simulations predict. So this orange band is an uh, 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 embodied cosmological simulation with embedded disk potential to emulate uh, some of the baryon effects. Okay, so 
In my talk, uh, I'm going to show you firstly some results on gas halo connection and halo responses to feedback in simulations. And then I will move on to the second uh, model that uh, Sandy mentioned, uh, which uh, deals with satellite galaxies and dwarf galaxies, and they use them to probe cosmology and the formation of the host, also as a test uh, of uh, uh, baryonic physics uh, treatment in simulations. All right, uh, so first part. Um, we know that uh, a standard picture uh, for galaxy growth, at least uh, at high redshift, is that uh, galaxies grow through this filamentary accretion. So dark matter and the gas feed the growth of uh, uh, the, the, the central galaxy uh, through this uh, cosmic filaments. Typically, a uh, galaxy have three or four filaments. Uh, so the, they have a very similar, so the gas and the dark matter have very similar uh, topology on the, on the large scales. They experience very similar tidal torques so at the moment of entering the viral radius or the halo size, our halo, they have comparable uh, specific angular momentum. Uh, and if you further assume that angular momentum is conserved during gas cooling and galaxy formation, right, if you assume that by the time when the gas reached the central part of the galaxy where uh, the form stars, then this assumption makes it very convenient to predict the galaxy size using halo properties alone. So basically you can write the specific angular momentum as some characteristic size times the rotation. So the galaxy size can be written as the product of four factors. The first factor is uh, the, the specific angular momentum ratio between the galaxy and the dark matter halo. The second factor is what we call the spin parameter of the halo. It's simply a dimensionless measurement of the specific angular momentum. So the denominator is the size of the halo times uh, the circular velocity evaluated at uh, the halo boundary. The third, the third parameter is the, uh, the ratio between the galaxy uh, rotation speed and the halo's uh, velocity scale. We know that um, galaxies have, uh, roughly speaking, flat ro rotation curves. And together with this assumption, right, we can cancel the first and third term, the, the first and third factors. So we are left with only the halo spin parameter and the halo radius. So galaxy size is linked to halo properties alone. And this is the nominal uh, mo, mau, and white uh, recipe for predicting galaxy sizes uh, uh, so which is pretty much used in every single semi-analytic model for galaxy formation uh, up to date. There are different variants of this relation uh, considering adiabatic contraction, et cetera, but uh, this is uh, basically the picture in a nutshell. So do we really have uh, evidence for this theoretical picture, right? Some people think yes. For example, Andre mm -hmm. Krafthoff and Richard Somerville et al., they basically took a large survey so you have a galaxy sizes, you have galaxy masses, and you invert this uh, abundance matching relation, uh, which by the way, is not trivial because you need to consider the scatter. But at the end of the day, you go from galaxy mass to halo mass and from the definition of halo uh, viral mass, you can work out the halo uh, boundary radius or viral radius. So you can put your galaxies on the space spanned by galaxy size versus the halo radius R, halo or R200. Um, and uh, uh, basically this is a plot from Andrew Kraftsov and he realized that all his galaxies, not, not only in the late type galaxies, but also the early types, uh, they all follow this nice linear relation with a proportionality of 0 0.02. And if you are familiar with cosmological simulations, you know that the halo spin parameter is of the order of 0 0.04. And we are astronomers, we know that a factor of two is nothing, right? So it seems that this relation, uh, the moma wide picture for galaxy size is uh, pretty uh, good. What's more, what's, what's even better is that this uh, scatter, uh, the, the scatter of this relation happens to be comparable to the scatter in, uh, in the spin parameter uh, as measured in uh, cosmological simulations. Uh, but this uh, all are uh, very misleading because uh, then we realize when we look into uh, 
uh, the modern uh, cosmological hydro simulations, uh, uh, we realize that this assumption of angular momentum conservation is not valid. So let me, let me show you here. So we looked into two different uh, suites of simulations, the Vela simulation, uh, which is run with uh, a, a adaptive mesh code uh, and it features a relatively weak uh, barium feedback. And we also have this uh, Nihao simulation, which is run with the uh, uh, SPH code. Uh, so it's just completely uh, uh, different uh, numerical details and very complementary in terms of the feedback strength. So Vela has a weaker feedback and Nihao have stronger feedback. So these are very complementary suites of simulations to look at. And when you plot the galaxy spin versus the halo spin, uh, remember that spin is always defined as the specific angular momentum of the corresponding component normalized by the divided by the halo uh, uh, angular momentum scale. So R halo times V halo. So X can be the galaxy, can be the gas, can be stars, or can be the dark matter in the case of the lambda halo. So it's equivalent to uh, plotting J gal versus J halo. And you realize there is no correlation whatsoever. In the, in the simulations. And uh, you may argue that the MoMA wide picture was devised for uh, like thin disks, right? So whereas the simulations do not necessarily produce disky galaxies. Okay, we can look at the disk component of the stars. Okay, we do a simple uh, kinematic decomposition of the stellar distribution. And still you realize there's no, no correlation whatsoever. So, so this assumption is not necessarily valid and this recipe for galaxy size is uh, not uh, robust. Uh, and you can check this directly. So this is the galaxy size divided by halo size versus the, uh, the spin parameter of the halo and there's no correlation whatsoever. So, uh, so what's going on, right? So uh, I, we think that the partial uh, explanation at least is this uh, picture that I'm going to show you, what we call the uh, wet compaction or gaseous compaction uh, events that uh, high redshift galaxies uh, typically experience. So uh, we are looking at a, a representative example in the Vela simulation, and these are the gas density maps uh, ordered in the time sequence of the A, B, C, D. So initially this galaxy at some high redshift, it's a uh, gas rich and uh, the gas somehow loses angular momentum due to uh, either uh, major minor mergers or a counter rotating cosmic filaments. Somehow it loses uh, momentum. So the gas funnel to the center and it forms a very dense core. Uh, so this process is uh, what the uh, Avishai Daiko and the collaborators uh, like to call wet compaction or this, uh, 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 or a blue nugget stage of, uh, of high redshift massive galaxy evolution. So with a blue nugget, uh, we have a high star formation rate. So that's why we call it blue. Okay, it's not necessarily vis visually blue uh, if you look at, the, the, look at this galaxy through a telescope because the, this ga these galaxies could be dusty, so it can be, can, can, can be similarly red, but it's, uh, the blue refers to the uh, fact that they have high uh, star formation rate in the center. So you have high star formation rate and you have therefore a uh, very quick gas depletion in the center. And after a few dynamical times, you are left with a, a hollow center in terms of gas distribution. And then freshly accreted gas with higher uh, specific angular momentum settles into a disky or ring like structure. And this disk or ring is stabilized by the uh, blue nugget, which has by now turned into a young stellar bulge. Okay, so the bulge serves as a stabilizing mechanism. Uh, you, you realize that through this whole process, the galaxy's angular momentum content fluctuates drastically, whereas the halo should uh, remain roughly the same. Right? The halo is uh, the, the bigger envelope that hosts the galaxy. To uh, illustrate this, so, so here we plot uh, the, gas, the gas spin as a function of time and the dark matter spin as a function of time for all the Vela galaxies, but they are stacked at their respective moment of this wet compaction or blue nugget events. Okay. So you see, can see that before compaction, um, the, the, the spin value is low. Uh, after compaction, the gas spin jumps, uh, increases. Whereas on average, the halo spin parameter remains roughly the same throughout uh, history.
And the color coding here is the halo's zero mass. Uh, and if you're careful enough, you, you realize that the compaction, uh, that uh, like where they're stacked, uh, all happen around the halo mass of a few times 10 to the 11 solar masses. Uh, and this is better uh, uh, illustrated in this uh, mosaic. Again, these are randomly chosen uh, representative examples from Vela simulations organized in the order of uh, halo mass versus redshifts. Uh, you realize that compaction all happens around the halo mass of uh, around uh, a few times 10 to the 11 solar masses. So it's a, a mass trend, not a redshift trend. If you look at the upper right panel, which is a statistical view, right? So here it's uh, each pixel is uh, the uh, ensemble average of a lot of uh, Vela galaxies. And the color coding here is rotation divided by random motion. Um, you can see that um, uh, only above a few times 10 to the 11, you develop stable uh, rotation uh, support. So it's a mass trend, not a redshift trend and uh, compaction events or the, uh, or the disk formation preluded, preluded by compaction events all happen at a few times 10 to the 11 solar masses. You can also look at this by uh, following the, the, the angular momentum vector on the sky. So the vector uh, is defined by two angles, theta and the phi. So it's the pointing on the sky and the cross indicates the compaction event. You start off with, uh, with this uh, triangle and before compaction, the spin vector fluctuates dramatically and after compaction, it stabilizes, indicating that uh, a stable disk has developed. So this cartoon basically summarizes this um, uh, compaction uh, picture. So we have a pre-blue nugget, a low mass halo with a lot of random motion, then gas compaction, uh, and, uh, which are associated with mergers or counter rotating filaments. Uh, and then uh, with the young stellar bulge stabilizing the disk, we can finally develop a stable disk in the post-compaction massive halos. Note that this is already in contradiction with this MoMA wide picture of uh, uh, predicting galaxy sizes. In that picture, galaxies start off with a disk configuration. Whereas in the simulations, we, real we realize the galaxies at high redshift start off with irregular shape, random motion, only until later stage when their mass reaches uh, some critical scale, they develop stable disks. Uh, this is not only uh, not just a, a theoretical speculation. We actually see a lot of uh, uh, um, like uh, 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 post compaction uh, this uh, ring plus about uh, configuration in the candle survey. So these are mostly green dollar gases. So. Compaction also, uh, so it's beyond the content of this, this talk, but uh, compaction is also believed to uh, trigger quenching or the onset of uh, the uh, uh, fast growth of supermassive black holes. But back to the, uh, uh, our galaxy halo connection story, right? I think that the, the seminal MoMA wide model was devised for angular momentum conserved stable thin disks in a cuspy uh, so-called NFW documented halos without baryonic feedback. And none of this uh, keywords uh, or uh, assumptions as uh, uh, represented by these keywords are uh, not valid. None of them is valid. So uh, in, in not only in the, in the simulations, but also in the real universe, we know that uh, disks are irregular. We know that we have uh, feedback. So no wonder it doesn't work. Um, but what's more intriguing is that um, for the post blue nugget uh, systems, at least in the Vela simulation, they seem to follow this uh, normal white model pretty nicely. So that's relatively speaking where this, uh, all these assumptions are, are compar uh, comparatively more valid okay, compared to the pre blue nugget phases. But as I mentioned, different simulations have different treatment in feedback and resolution, numerical details. So, so the right-hand panel is uh, it's the same parameter space so the y-axis is the actual sizes measured in the simulation and the horizontal axis is the model uh, size predicted by this uh, MoMA wide galaxy halo connection model. And so in the Nihao simulation, which features high, uh, stronger uh, feedback and uh, it has lower resolution. Um, so generally speaking, Nihao doesn't resolve compaction that well. And no wonder that uh, 
results are qualitatively different. So simulations disagree among themselves. Uh, we want to be constructive, right? We show that the spin parameter is kind of irrelevant for galaxy sizes, but we want to be, uh, we want to come up with something new. So in the same parameter space, uh, galaxy size versus halo size, we calico the galaxies by another halo quantity. Uh, this is the, the concentration index of the halo. It essentially measures um, for a given halo mass, how deep the potential well, how deep the potential well is, or how compact the, the dark matter distribution is. So operational definition here, so the radius of the halo divided by the, ra the characteristic radius at which the logarithmic density slope is minus two. Okay. It's widely used in uh, all kinds of uh, semi-empirical, semi-analytical models for galaxy formation. And you realize that the galaxies at a given halo size or halo mass, larger galaxies prefer lower concentration. So if you fold this concentration dependence into the modeling, you know, through a simple power law, you can already get a tighter relation. So again, this is a purely a dark matter halo quantities on the horizontal axis, concentration to some power, times the halo uh, boundary radius. So this was uh, basically uh, 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 the concentration dependence was uh, uh, selected by try and error. We want to do it more systematically, more thoroughly. Um, so this uh, exercise can be aided by the machine learning uh, algorithms. So uh, uh, nowadays we are looking into uh, some of the highest resolution large box simulations, for example, the TNG50 simulation um, uh, in, in order to look for uh, uh, more broadly what halo parameters are relevant for galaxy size. So uh, these are just a um, uh, very preliminary uh, example. So the halo quantities we are considering include uh, the spin parameter of the halo, this Vmax tilde, you can regard it as a concentration proxy. So it's essentially equivalent to concentration. Mmax is the mass enclosed within the radius at which circular velocity peaks. Uh, and the Z50 is the uh, redshift by which the halo uh, for the first time assembled 50% of its final mass. And the ZLMM is the last major merger epoch uh, and M dot uh, is the uh, average uh, mass growth rate over the last dynamical time. And the PC1, PC2 are the first two principal components of the VMAX history. So these two parameters uh, are introduced because we want to uh, use some of the uh, assembly history information of the halo, which are potentially relevant for uh, galaxy properties as well. But as uh, this uh, uh, random forest regression algorithm tells us, right, it speeds out a performance score and the relative importance for predicting the target quantity, which is the galaxy size to halo size ratio. So this algorithm tells us that the most relevant uh, uh, halo quantity is the Vmax tilt or the concentration proxy. So it's uh, telling a coherent story compared to what I showed you previously using uh, human learning. So this is machine learning results. Now, all the other parameters seem to uh, contribute uh, minimally, including the spin parameter. So if you, again, the bottom panels, so the uh, upper left panel shows you uh, the, the, like the, the test result. Uh, so this is measured in the simulations and the horizontal axis is the same quantity. So the half mass radius of the stars divided by the halo radius constructed by this random forest model. Uh, and the bottom panels are, so uh, galaxy size versus uh, halo size uh, measured in the simulations. And the right hand side is this, uh, galaxy size versus the model, random forest model predicted uh, galaxy size. You can see how tight it is. Uh, speaking of uh, galaxy halo uh, connection, uh, so the size is just one aspect of it. More broadly, it also uh, uh, include morphology or other aspects as well. So one uh, um, interesting example is the ultra diffuse population. As I mentioned earlier, it's, it's comparable in size to the Milky Way or Andromeda, but it's a stellar mass is just a, a 10 to the seven or 10 to the eight solar masses typically. So uh, it's, uh, the defining feature is the, lar it's the large size and the, the uh, low surface brightness. Uh, so people uh, have uh, speculated about their formation mechanism. 
whether they are failed Milky Ways in terms of uh, the halo mass, right? Whether their host halos are Milky Way sized hosts, or whether their ho or if their hosts are just a dwarf sized host, but they are somehow puffed up uh, by some process. And uh, and ultra diffuse population are spotted in isolation as well as in uh, dense environments. They, they, they were mostly discovered in dense environments, but they also exist in, in isolation. So we want to know how do they form in the field and in a dense environment separately. So here is uh, our uh, uh, view in the, in the Nihao uh, cosmological simulations. So the simulation consists of a suite of about 100 galaxies ranging between the halo mass of a few times 10 to the nine all the way to a few times uh, 10 to the 12, so compact uh, groups. Uh, and we are contrasting uh, the UDGs to the control sample, the full sample, in terms of the distribution of halo mass uh, concentration and the halo spin parameter in the simulations. You can, you can see that the UDGs all prefer this uh, narrow halo mass range of 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 11 solar masses, or equivalently speaking, this is a stellar to halo mass ratio of 10 to the minus 3.5 to about 1%. So memorize this value. So this is the preferred um, halo, um, uh, stellar to halo ratio for the ultra diffuse population. Um, they are not faster rotators in terms of their halo spin, right? So their spin parameter is not very different from the control sample, but they have, uh, relatively speaking, lower concentration, at least lower than uh, the average value expected for halos of their sizes, of their masses, which is the purple band. This is a cosmological average concentration for halos of this mass scale. Uh, but the actual UDGs, although they have these masses, they have lower concentrations, as you can see from the middle panel. So it's uh, telling a coherent story compared to the previous uh, uh, study. Um, so what happens in detail is that UDGs are puffed up by repeated supernova-driven outflows, uh, which is the same process that transforms dark matter cusps to uh, cores. Um, so the right-hand panel is. Um, um, uh, we actually measured a uh, so-called burstiness parameter, which is uh, uh, like the, uh, the contrast uh, of the peaks and the dips in the star formation history. It's a proxy for the strengths of the supernovae uh, activities. Uh, and horizontal axis is a measurement of the diffuseness or the, the galaxy to halo size ratio. And the UDGs all populate this upper right corner, uh, uh, which have, uh, the, you can see from the color coding that they all live in this uh, core the dark matter halos. Okay. Um, the halo response to bursty star formation and the supernovae feedback is actually maximized in the, the massive dwarf halo regime or the UDG regime That's the, with the halo mass of a, a few times 10 to the 10 solar masses or stellar to halo ratio in this uh, preferred uh, range. So this um, is a way, the lower panel is a way to uh, quantify the halo response. Um, so the, ax the y axis is the concentration index of the halo measured in the hydro simulation divided by the concentration measured in the uh, initial condition matched uh, dark matter halos in the dark matter only run without variance. So this reflects halo response. Uh, you can see that in this UDG regime, um, the halo uh, have lower concentration than uh, their correspondence, their counterparts in the dark matter only run. This upshooting here at the most massive end is the adiabatic contraction uh, effect that uh, I, I briefly mentioned in the, in the very beginning. So we actually uh, have an issue here uh, in the sense that uh, uh, the simulations predict too many uh, ultra diffuse population, especially in this UDG regime. Things are, so every symbol here is a, is a simulation and the grayscale and the lines are, are observational uh, samples. I can see in the UDG uh, regime, um, that there are pretty much everything is ultra diffuse uh, or diffuse. Whereas simulation, uh, whereas observations for sure tell us that there exists um, compact populations of uh, bright dwarf galaxies. So this uh, leaves us some questions for future studies. Is uh, star formation recipe flawed, right? Maybe uh, uh, AGM play a role 
maybe there are some of the, uh, the uh, compact population are splashback satellites. Okay, speaking of satellites, uh, I want to use one example of uh, the, uh, UDG, a simulated UDG to uh, show you uh, what a satellite experiences in the, uh, in the tidal, in the dense environment. So here we are looking at a bunch of uh, histories, okay? Orbit radius, subhalo mass, stellar mass, cold gas, specific star formation rate, galaxy size, and the kinematic energy of the stars and the, the ratio between kinematic energy and the potential energy of the whole system. Uh, and uh, uh, the line is uh, the evolutionary path of uh, one uh, typical UDG. Uh, and the vertical lines are the moments where uh, it uh, comes into the bigger host. And the second vertical line is the pericenter, is the pericenter passage. So several things happen at the first pericenter. First of all, uh, you lose a lot of uh, subhalar mass. It's a, a feature of tidal stripping, but your stellar mass remains roughly the same. Okay, meaning that whereas tidal stripping affects the subhalar significantly, it has not uh, affected the stellar component uh, uh, very uh, significantly. However, the cold gas uh, decreases to zero uh, together with a specific star formation. This tells you that uh, the, the, the relevant mechanism for removing the gas is not tides, right? Because tides has not uh, affected the stellar component yet. So the only remaining mechanism is the ramp pressure stripping of the, of the gas. So a satellite or a UDG here experienced tidal stripping and ramp pressure stripping. And most importantly and interestingly, right at the first Paris center, its size got bumped by a factor of two. Uh, and therefore it becomes, uh, uh, it, so when it fell in, it was a normal galaxy. And after the first pericenter passage, it become an ultra diffuse uh, galaxy as represented by the uh, red uh, uh, highlighting. And this is a characteristic behavior uh, as can be seen from the, from the energetics, right? This is a, a typical of uh, what's so-called impulsive tidal heating, basically, through this impulsive encounters with the densest part of the host, some of the orbital energy of the satellites is transformed into the internal energy. And this puff, puffs up the stellar component as well. So this is how UDG forms in a, in, a, in a dense environment. So in isolation, UDGs are puffed up by repeated supernovae outflows associated with bursty star formation history. And in a dense environment, the UDGs are puffed up by tidal heating, and are quenched by uh, ram pressure stripping. Uh, and the UDGs populate dwarf halos of low concentration and normal halo spin parameter consistent with the more general galaxy halo connection we, uh, we were talking about earlier. And several more recent numerical studies have confirmed our uh, uh, two channel formation picture as mentioned here. And this new uh, recipe for galaxy size has been adopted in a semi-analytic model for galaxy formation. So finally, let me use the uh, last uh, few minutes to uh, tell you about uh, the, uh, our semi-analytic efforts to quantify some of the uh, small scale issues. Uh, so this is a recast of the uh, small scale issues I mentioned in the beginning, but here I replaced the lower right panel with just a galaxy size versus luminosity plane. So I think it's uh, manifesting the same issue of, uh, uh, of the structural diversity in the sense that we have uh, in the bright dwarf regime as highlighted by this region, we have uh, all the way, uh, so galaxies ranging all the way from ultra diffuse to compact. So it's equivalent to say they have a variety of rotation curves as uh, previously shown. So to address these small scale issues, we have uh, uh, two complementary camps of methods, the simulations and the semi-analytic methods. I do not need to elaborate on this uh, details uh, and you do not need to follow uh, the, uh, this very busy plot, but I just want to tell you that uh, simulations operate on particles and cells, whereas the semi-analytic methods operate on the halo assembly history trees, the halo merger trees. Uh, and then after you construct a merger tree or you have a merger tree taken from an in-body cosmological simulation, you have a bunch of uh, recipes describing the, the evolution of the galaxies and the satellites. Uh, you populate the galaxies to the halos using the galaxy halo connections aforementioned. 
And the, you evolve the satellites using empirical analytical recipes uh, regarding tidal effects, ram pressure, and dynamical friction, uh, which causes the orbit to decay, et cetera. So at the end of the day, you have a very efficient tool uh, with simplifying assumptions calibrated to the simulations, but it can have the power to, uh, to very quickly generate large samples of uh, satellite galaxy populations. And you have uh, the convenience of controlling specific physical processes if you want to quantify their contributions. So uh, let me go directly to, to, the, uh, to the results regarding the tube to fail problem. So remember that uh, the tube to fail refers to uh, the, uh, the velocity gap between the Magellanic clouds and the rest of the population. We can use the set gen framework to generate thousands of uh, Milky Ways. Uh, so this is actually done in my laptop in a couple of hours. This highlights the computational efficiency of this model. Uh, so among this large ensemble, we can, oh, the bulk of it, right? It's indeed uh, similar to the simulations. Right? It's represented by the, the gray scale. It's the, the average is the, the, the line in the middle and the, the different shades of gray are the one, two and three sigma scatter of the halo to halo variance regarding the uh, cumulative satellite Vmax distribution, okay? Um, on average, the model is consistent with the simulations in the sense that it goes right through the velocity gap here. But among this large population, you can always identify a few that is consistent with the actual Milky Way, which is the red dots. The right-hand side panel is uh, just one random example from this Milky Way consistent example. You can see how nicely the two Magellanic clouds stand out and the rest of the rotation curves go right across the uh, Milky Way satellites uh, kinematic data. So this is without taking into account baryon effects. More recently, uh, we have uh, been considering uh, the baryons. Uh, but again, simulations disagree among themselves re regarding baryon feedback schemes. Uh, and therefore they have uh, different uh, uh, strands of halo responses. Um, so for, uh, again, this is uh, the upper panel is, uh, um, is the density slope as a function of uh, uh, the stellar to halo uh, ratio, or you can regard it as a star formation efficiency. The bottom panel is the one that you, uh, you have seen previously for the UDGs. So this is the concentration measured in the hydro run divided by the concentration in the matching dark matter olein run. Um, the two lines, right, the, the two bands, the uh, black and orange, they correspond to camps of simulations. Uh, uh, the black one is uh, uh, from the Nihao simulation the featuring burst feedback. Uh, the fire simulation have a very similar behavior uh, compared to Nihao. Uh, the orange one uh, is from the uh, postal simulation. It's the, like a zoom in volume of the Eagle uh, uh, simulation. Uh, so it features most feedback, uh, weaker feedback. So throughout the range, throughout the mass range, we have uh, cusp halos uh, and more concentrated halos due to adiabatic contraction. Okay. Only in the strong feedback uh, simulations, we have this core formation, which is optimal in the bright dwarf regime. And we have this uh, slight expansion of, uh, of the overall halo as represented by the concentration index, this dip, small dip here. So these are all for isolated halos because the simulations zoom in on isolated systems. But we want to study uh, the Milky Way satellite population. So this is a missing link here. Uh, and this, you can run the simulation for Milky Way and uh, 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 use super high resolution, but this uh, costs you a lot of computation resources and it's very slow. And it, it's not very easy uh, to generate large statistical sample, but we can use the Saturn framework okay, to propagate this huge difference to the satellite population. Okay? We can let the Saturn framework to emulate the Nihau or FIRE simulation, which features strong feedback, or the apostle simulation, which features smoother, smoother feedback. And the, we can propagate the halo response patterns to very simple parameter space, like the satellite galaxy size versus stellar mass. As you can see for the fire Nihau emulator, we have a lot of ultra diffuse population. 
Now, th this is already different from the size mass plane that I showed you earlier, where I highlighted the, uh, the simulations over predict UDGs. Here is the satellite population. Previously, it's the this, uh, distinct the galaxy population. And you realize that the scatter is larger here. So some of the some of the satellites through tidal heating, tidal stripping revealization, they get bumped up to even more diffuse territory, okay? And, but still you have very few uh, compact populations. So a typical formation channel for the so-called ultra compact dwarfs is that they're the, uh, the remnants of the larger systems, basically the things move from this mass regime to, to somewhere here through this kind of tracks. But no, they are, they're not there in, in, the, in this uh, uh, strong feedback emulator, this uh, compact dwarf population is rather limited. In this smooth feedback emulator, we have a, a, a both ends. So a little bit of the diffuse population, a little bit uh, of the uh, compact population. But still, I'm not uh, arguing for the Apostle or Riga uh, simulations because I still think we are not capturing the full extent of the structural diversity here. So we, we here we have about one dex of uh, uh, scattering size, but actually observationally we have uh, uh, two or three decks uh, in terms of uh, uh, the size uh, span in, in, in this uh, mass regime of 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 solar masses. So I'm not arguing for one type of feedback or one type of simulation. Uh, the point is we have a very efficient framework to propagate the halo response patterns to satellite population uh, in SatGen. So uh, let me uh, wrap up the talk to uh, to really uh, uh, conclude uh, uh, and uh, uh, leave uh, all the uh, rest to uh, discussion. Uh, so I think uh, I, I hope I've convinced you that uh, um, the galaxy spin size and morphology, they are not very much correlated with the halo spin parameter, but instead some uh, other structural parameters like the, the concentration index of the halo may be relevant. And we are currently using machine learning algorithms to help uh, uh, more efficiently explore such uh, 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 potentially important halo quantities. Uh, and as a, a concrete example uh, of a gas halo connection studies, uh, I, I talked about the ultra diffuse population. Uh, and, and I think in our study, we settled the dispute whether they live in Milky Way sized host or dwarf sized host. In the simulations, at least, they exclusively populate dwarf-sized hosts in the mass range of uh, 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 11 solar masses. And in isolation, uh, they are produced by burst tree star formation and supernovae outflows and the consequent halo responses. And as satellites in a dense environment, the ultra-diffuse galaxy population are puffed up by tidal heating at uh, uh, orbital pericenters and they are quenched by run pressure. Um, in the simulations, there are too many ultra diffuse population and uh, no compact dwarfs, in, uh, I should say, in some of the simulations. So we still have a structural diversity problem in the simulations. Uh, we used uh, the set gen framework, which incorporates some of the gap halo connections uh, and uh, together with uh, the recipes for tidal evolution, uh, and ram pressure to address uh, set, some of the satellite issues. Uh, I only have time to talk about one example, which is the typical to fail uh, problem. So I showed you that even, even, if, even if you don't consider variant effects, there, there is 1% um, of uh, at least a percent level of Milky Way sized hosts um, that are free from typical to fail. This, uh, like a, uh, this is uh, like uh, achieved through drastically different halo-to-halo uh, uh, -halo variants of the assembly history. So for 1% of the assembly histories, uh, the satellite population can be such that they are consistent with uh, the actual Milky Way. So another way to say it is our Milky Way is a 1% outlier. Uh, but considering variance, this fraction may be higher. Uh, I don't have to uh, have time to address the other uh, issues, but uh, I, I showed you uh, um, that uh, the SAPGEN can very efficiently propagate the halo response relations from uh, which are extracted from the distinct halos in simulations all the way to the small uh, satellite population in a dense environment. 
is potentially very use, uh, useful for uh, distinguish uh, 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 feedback patterns or um, to, uh, to solve this, uh, to alleviate those uh, uh, satellite di structural diversity problems. And uh, yeah, thank you for, for your attention. More than happy to take any question. Thank you a lot, Fang Zhu, uh, for this very uh, interesting talk. And also, uh, you did like uh, a lecture here with a very nice introduction for everybody that is not in the field. Um, I have um, several questions to make, but I will give the opportunity to the audience to, to ask first. And if they have no questions, then I will proceed with my ones. So people in the audience, if somebody wants to, to start, you can just unmute yourself and ask. I see somebody that unmuted the microphone, but is not uh, asking. Sí. Oh, yeah. No, pero, pero tú, ¿no? Eh, es que yo no puedo decir la tuya. Bueno. <laughs> Patricia, you have a question? Eh, sorry, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Armando Hello. has a question. It's actually me. <laughs> Armando. <laughs> uh, so, uh, thank you very much, by the way, for the talk. It was, it was very good. And I learned a lot. So I have a couple of questions. One of them is, when you say that the UDGs get puffed due to the interaction near the, well, the pre-center, I was wondering, uh, in principle, they will also get elongated, right? So yes. can you see that effect? Uh, I assume that you cannot do it with such gen, but in principle, you could see it in the numerical simulations. So when you do that, you, I mean, can you measure that? Can you distinguish the UDGs yes. that are puffed intrinsically by star formation? or by feedback in general, um, from the ones that are puffed yeah. by interaction? So I, I think you are referring to UVGs in a dense environment. Uh, yes. So uh, it's, uh, the, I mean, the, by the way, the shape business is also very interesting for distinct UVGs, but uh, we can talk about that after addressing this question. So in a dense environment, uh, at, at least in these uh, simulations, um, uh, we don't see a lot of tidal feature, uh, the, like uh, uh, tidal tails or elongations due to uh, the strip of the stars, uh, because it's, as I showed you uh, in, in one of the uh, evolutionary history uh, plots, the stellar component is really not significantly affected by, uh, by tidal stripping. So there's no much uh, tidal truncation or tidal uh, tails per se, but uh, the, the satellites experience the tidal heating, which is the more subtle effect, right? So the the stars get uh, uh, bumped up in in uh, in, in their in, in their uh, 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 random motion, their internal energy. So the whole system um, becomes puffier. Uh, it's not necessarily more more elongated, but these two effects are uh, like a goes hand in hand. It's uh, extremely hard to say it's only experience the tidal heating, but not tidal truncation. So it, it must be a smooth spectrum. But in the limited sample we have, right, it's a super hard to simulate a huge sample of uh, satellites uh, uh, with decent resolution. But uh, yeah, but uh, I believe with, a, with a, a better simulation, we can start to address this issue. So uh, the shape, to measure the shapes of, uh, of uh, uh, satellite UDGs, that would be interesting. And, and back to my earlier comments on the, on the uh, field UDGs, um, uh, we, we, we measured their shapes and they tend to be more uh, prolate, uh, more elongated, than uh, uh, similar uh, the galaxies of similar masses in the field. Uh, and, and that's uh, really intriguing. Uh, that might, might be related to the uh, supernovae, uh, like off-centered supernovae outflow, uh, uh, which drive gas out. And then when the gas cools and uh, it's recycled, they form stars at the off-center location. So this could uh, drive the elongation in the, in the field, uh, in the field UDG. So even, even in the field, the UDG shapes may be uh, maybe distinguished from the other the other normal galaxies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The, the other thing was simply that you say that the Milky Way is a one percent outlier, which is free because of uh, TVT TF. But I wonder, M thirty one will be also an outlier, or will it be in the? So yeah, in that particular study, we uh, didn't look at the Andromeda satellite population because at that time, so it's a 2015 uh, work, uh, at that time, the, the Andromeda satellite population was not as complete as today. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, a good time to revisit uh, together, uh, not only uh, with uh, Andromeda, but also with a larger sample. So 
Uh, nowadays, there's a Sangha survey, uh, which uh, uh, when finished, would have uh, 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 around 100 uh, near, uh, Milky, nearby Milky Way analogs uh, focusing on their satellite population. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it will be valuable observational sample to compare to. So it, I think it's important for both uh, the theory and the observation to have a statistical sample to make a sensible comparison. For, for, for Andromeda uh, specifically, I think it doesn't necessarily have this gap feature, right? Uh, because there's like the, in the Milky Way, it's really special. Like, uh, uh, and, the, and the two, two Magellanic clouds are re uh, re uh, relatively speaking uh, created recently. And before that, it has a quiescent merging history as can be inferred from the Gaia uh, uh, results. Uh, for Andromeda, it's not necessarily like that, but uh, still qualitatively, they are similar in the sense that if you plot the Vmax distribution of, uh, of the satellites, it's, uh, it has a shallower slope than the simulations. Um, so, so by uh, allowing uh, feedback in, like in, by going to hydro uh, from dark matter only to hydro, you have you, you basically introduce two barrier effects uh, that can affect the Vmax distribution. One is uh, the leading effect is the, the Milky Way disk or the galactic disk, which can disrupt the satellites. So this basically brings down the, 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 the Vmax function, the Vmax distribution, but it won't necessarily change the slope. The other is the um, uh, core formation. Like, the, like uh, if you form a core, your structural evolution, your Vmax evolution would be different compared to your Caspi case. This may have the hope of broadening the Vmax distribution a little bit. Uh, and it's, uh, it's going to be dependent and uh, somewhat sensitive to, to the feedback implementation or to, bury, uh, to uh, dark matter nature, which I haven't got time to address. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Thank you, Wenzu. Yeah. Good, perfect. Thanks, Armando. Uh, and now, if you want, I, I will start with uh, some of my questions. The first one is uh, regarding one of the last uh, figures you, you showed, the one comparing fire and Nihau with, uh, with um, the Auriga. This one? Um, the problem in the fire Nihau, in where you have a very small amount of uh, compact dwarfs, can it be related with the lack of resolution that uh, Nihau has? Because these are very compact objects, so probably there is a the, the resolution plays an important role here to form so compact objects. So also, in addition to the feedback, probably the resolution can be a, a, a point here. I don't know if this with the suggestion you can address this uh, this point. Yeah, I think that's definitely uh, one of the motivation of uh, applying SETGEN to this uh, kind of studies. Um, so Nihao definitely uh, uh, may be uh, limited in this um, uh, in, in this regard. So so the the best resolution is uh, a few tens of uh, uh, parsecs um, at ratio zero. So um, it's marginally uh, sufficient for probing. Uh, the sizes um, of uh, say a one, key, one kpc object or a few, K, uh, few hundred uh, kpc, a uh, few, few hundred parsec uh, sizes object. So Nihao is limited. Uh, so, but fire, right? The fire simulations uh, and this Lupi Atoll is another gizmo. So fire uses the gizmo code. So Lupi Atoll is another gizmo simulation of uh, decent resolution. So the fire resolution can be parsec level, and they they still have this bump here. So relative to the to straight line extrapolated size mass relation. So I I, I think this is not a uh, so this bump or the the lack of uh, compact dwarfs is not uh, not only in a resolution uh, issue, um, but uh, more related to to feedback. Uh, so so for for set gen right. So uh, the we can. Um, we can achieve much higher resolution. Uh, so um, as long as the recipe is tested, um, yeah, we can achieve much better resolution uh, and propagate uh, to satellites. Yeah. Okay, good, good point. Uh, yes, the uh, fire is, is, uh, is much more, has much higher resolution, that's true, that's true. And also, I think these ones you are uh, saying that it's a loopy et al. I think it's kind of a resimulation of Nihau. I think there are some resimulations of Nihau with a very high resolution. I am not, uh, I, I don't okay. remember exactly the, the name of these new yeah. ones. Uh, also related with simulations at the very beginning, you, you showed 
the relation between the, the lambda stellar disk versus lambda halo. And you said that there is no clear correlation, but well, while for the, the other plot that is uh, the global stellar mass in, in a elliptical versus the, the halo mass in there, you can see clearly that there is no correlation. In the one of a stellar disk, you can see kind of, no, the previous, uh, the previous slide to, to this one, the, the one you are showing now, the previous one, in the previous one, you uh, the no, uh, or maybe this one. No, it it was exactly the, the one you were showing, but without the 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 wavelet uh, uh, blurring of the of the structures. Uh, when you were showing Nihao, also here you were, co you were comparing Bella with Nihao. Ah, this one exactly. Yeah. But the next one in this one is clear that there is no correlation. But in the next one, you can kind of feel that there is uh, at least in Nihao. Uh, a kind of a, a shape here, no? Kind of a, a, a small correlation between the, the two, the two uh, uh, lambdas, and it is much yeah. more clear in Nihao than in Bela. Is the difference? You know where the difference come from? Is uh, again resolution? Is because of the SPH versus AMR? Is because of the feedback that you are having systematically a more well-defined uh, kind of correlation in, yeah. in Nihao than in Bela? Yeah, it can be, as, as you speculated or uh, uh, correctly pointed out, it's, it can be a combination of many things, I think. Uh, I really have a clear cut answer, uh, but uh, let me mention uh, uh, how, uh, in what aspects they differ. You, you, you know uh, as much as I know, right? Uh, Villa has better resolution, uh, but Villa is um, uh, selected to be uh, about Milky Way size at redshift one by the end of their simulation. Um, and Villa, ha Villa has weaker feedback, so uh, they are uh, on average uh, a factor of two or three higher than the abundance matching uh, stellar halo relation um, uh, at the ratio of one. And these plots, right, for these plots, uh, the dots are uh, several uh, redshifts uh, uh, stacked, so they are separated. Uh, long enough in time uh, to uh, in eliminate any uh, like a uh, correlation introduced just by this like the same galaxies we using repeatedly, uh, but uh, so but for Vela it's redshift one and above, uh, and for the Nihao it's it includes some of the redshift zero population. So the Nihao simulation goes to redshift zero, and by redshift zero you develop uh, better disks I assume. Mm -hmm. uh, so. It, yeah. yeah, this can this can be like a, a good, yeah, 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 different morphological uh, fractions. Yeah, so difference probably came from 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 the the sampling no, of the of yeah. the different galactic uh, um, uh, histories and, and structures. Okay, good. And the very last question I have um, is when you uh, you showed the evolution of the spin of uh, of gas, and you you showed that there is a, a bump when when you have the compaction. And I was thinking, if you look at the evolution of the spin of the galaxy, when you are at a very high redshift, you have like a reservoir of angular momentum that is uh, in the gas that will be released to stars after star formation. As the mm -hmm. compaction is at, at the end, a very big star formation even, in this moment, you are transferring angular momentum from gas to stars because you are converting the gas to stars. So... Can also this make a difference here on the on, on this relation between a stellar a stellar uh, halo spin a stellar spin and halo spin? I mean, how is the evolution of the stellar spin yeah. when you have this kind of very big events of converting a lot of gas with high angular momentum to stars? Yeah, uh, definitely. So, uh, so basically, uh, the, the the question. Uh, just in case uh, for the audience. So, so the question is the gas and the stars doesn't necessarily have the same uh, angular momentum contents. So only in a, only in a, a subset of the gas can cool and settle to the center, right? That's, uh, that's your, your question. I think, I think yes. So the stellar, um, the stellar spin is on average uh, one order of magnitude lower. And also it uh, follows the same trend, right? Because, um, because of this, uh, Ring from a disk or ring formation. So these gas really tends into stars. So mm -hmm. they follow a similar behavior, uh, but the trend is kind of weaker because, uh, uh, yeah, the trend is weaker in the stars. 
Mm -hmm. But when you have gas depletion, you, you, is it possible that you have kind of a, a bump, a jump on the, the stellar angular momentum and kind of uh, um, uh, keeping uh, the same one for the gas because the gas uh, just lose a lot of gas that has a high angular moment. I, I don't know. It's just speculating how how really the relation between the gas spin and the the stellar the global stellar spin uh, is. I am not uh, hundred percent sure about uh, how this figure should be if you plot here instead of gas spin and halo spin also the the mm -hmm. stellar spin. For the entire, so maybe maybe a better way is to plot the baryon altogether. So yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Because yeah. at so, the end, uh, all the spin for the baryons is stored in between gas and star. So probably it's better to plot the, the total spin for baryons. Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, but I think we did experiment with that version of plot, and uh, uh, I can only say that qualitatively the trend is the same. But it's, okay, yeah, but somewhat weaker. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting. Good, perfect. And, and the very last question that was also answered for, for, for the one that uh, uh, Armando made is the how to distinguish between the two scenarios of ultra um, diffuse galaxies in observations. So you, have, you say that there are two channels, probably these two channels will drive to different observables. I don't know if metallicity, different metallicities, uh, you, you pointed out that probably different shapes. So you have some idea of the the most important yeah. thing to look at for these galaxies to distinguish between the two channels? Uh, so first of all, I don't think these two channels are uh, mutually exclusive. Uh, it can happen that a uh, UDG progenitor is already uh, processed by supernovae outflows and uh, um, they live in a somewhat cored uh, halo when they fell into a dense environment. And then the cored uh, subhalo can uh, facilitate the structural evolution uh, because it, compared to a cusp one, it's uh, easier for a cold one to get uh, more uh, tidal heating. Uh, uh, tidal heating goes as uh, 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 galaxy-centric distance squared, satellite-centric distance squared. So the more compact, the more you are shielded from tidal heating, the, the more diffuse uh, that you, you are initially the more susceptible, susceptible to tidal heating afterwards. So the environmental um, can, in fact, can basically um, uh, amplify this uh, um, uh, supernovae effect in isolation. Um, so to, in, so, but observationally, right, to, to verify these two mechanisms, right, in a dense environment, you want to look for uh, features of tidal heating like a flaring, uh, uh, like if you measure the kinematics, the, the heating usually is accompanied with this uh, uh, rising part of the uh, 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 line of sight velocity dispersion. Right? You can look for that. Uh, you can look for tidal features. People already done that. Uh, not, uh, not every uh, UDG show a, a tidal feature, so it's. Uh, but potentially it's not, it's also consistent with the uh, tidal heating uh, picture. Uh, in, in isolation, you, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, because of the repeated supernovae outflows, there can be uh, metallicity signals in, in, the, in these processes. Yeah. Um, mm. And there can be shape differences. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, so the, the field, even in the field, the UDGs are more prolate than, um, than similar similar mass, normal galaxies. Mm -hmm. So it's, it will be interesting in the future if we have a good metallicities to, to look the, the isolated versus the, the ones in dense environments and to just to check and to, to, to confirm that these two, uh, uh, to make to, to, yeah. to scenario, to be polar scenario for the formation of UDGs is really the, the one happened. No, yeah. it's probably uh, something for the future, maybe the next uh, telescopes and, and uh, space missions will help with that. Yeah, I'm not an expert on the uh, relation between, uh, say, metallicity yield or, or the, like a different uh, abundance, the uh, abundances of different uh, elements. What's that re re correlation with this uh, star formation firstness? Uh, I think that's something worth looking into, uh, also in the sim on the simulation side. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a for the isolated, if you have a bursty star formation like like uh, or a strong star formation more or less constant. 
uh, and, and uh, you will probably have a much different uh, alpha iron relation than the one for yeah. a galaxy that just uh, falls down to toward the center of a very dense environment and the star formation just uh, disappeared long time ago. So also probably that the, the yeah. alpha versus iron will be different and will be uh, worth uh, uh, looking at for, for this. Yeah, definitely. Thing. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, so uh, thank you a lot uh, for the very, very nice talk and for answering all uh, the large amount of questions uh, we had here. Uh, and it will be a pleasure in the future, uh, Fang Zhu, to invite you again to present uh, all, the, all the other very interesting results you had no time to present. So maybe next semester or the one in next autumn, it would be great to have you again and, and let you to present all, all, all the new work you are, and the new work you are, you are doing now. More than so happy to, you. and thanks a lot for having me here, and uh, thanks a lot for all the questions. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Thanks, and see you soon. Bye, Jihun. See you soon. Bye.